peace and blessings to each and every one of us. It's a pleasure to be in the house of the Lord, the house of the Lord without walls, to be able to present Dr. Bishop Nancy Rosario, my partner, the one that has been a blessing to me for 40 years. God has chosen her to also be the pastor of our church. I allow God to speak to me so that she could be the pastor and I could go forward and do all the other teachings outside because as we have said, we are one in the ministry. There's neither male nor female. And today God has chosen her to bring a message for each and every one of us. One of the greatest things that I see about her is that the love that she has for the Lord. You know, in the Old Testament, it speaks highly about the priests, but very little do they say about the women that were behind the priests or even in front of the priests and how God came and how the women were always in the back and Jesus said, there's neither male nor female. So today we are one, knowing that the spirit of God that dwells in me dwells in her and that that spirit is going to speak to us today and bring us the word of our creator, the God that loves the whole world, the God that doesn't see a race, the God that doesn't see man or female, he sees us all. So with that, I wanna say, may the Lord continue to bless each and every one of us. And with that, I present to you, Bishop Dr. Nancy Rosario, my partner, my wife, and my friend. God bless. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. I'm his partner in crime. <laughs> um, I am just so um, humbled to be here today. Thank you so much for asking me to speak amidst uh, such a great myriad of, of powerful women of God. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. I want to, you know, just greet, of course, ACLC Women in Ministry and its ministry leaders, Minister Rachel Jenkins, Archbishop Solange Lewis and Reverend Marilyn Katulik, and I give God all the highest praise, but I want to praise also and give God thanks for those that you selected to honor tonight, Dr. Eva Benson, Reverend Jane Wells, and Bishop Connie Banza. I can't even imagine what it would be like to lose this handsome man and have to take over those reins. It's like unimaginable for me, but Pastor Jane Wells, um, testimony when she spoke a few weeks ago still resonates in my heart. It resonates in my mind um, in hearing everything that she had to do to take over, especially the part where she says, it's not easy to prepare a sermon every single week to give to your congregation. So it's, it's admirable. And I know that God will continue to help them all. And I would be remiss if I don't give a shout out and a hand wave to Angelica Sally. <laughs> Nice to see you again. I always have her in my heart because my first trip to Korea, we kind of connected. So every time I see her, you know, my heart just resonates with, with love. So I, I, I've always enjoyed and I every time I see, I see the photos and I see us in that coffee shop in Korea, I'm like, yeah, there we go. And it was five of us women together and we had a great time even. It was um, also Senator Donzella James was with us. So that was really nice to have and all that. But today, you know, um, we're honoring our first ladies. I've been there, done that, still am, even though I've been elevated, but we're always going to be first and foremost first ladies of, of the church. And we have a unique platform to improve other people's lives. And we're not just chosen. We have a divine assignment. God has given us a divine assignment. We have some of our daughters that they said they would never, never, I would never marry a pastor. Well, they didn't. Their husbands became pastors later on. So they ended up marrying a pastor later on. So now five of them are married to pastors. So they're all first ladies and co-pastors and pastors. But we have a unique platform to improve lives. We have a divine assignment that is given from God. It's not given by man. It's given by God, a divine assignment. So Take that carefully to heart, a divine assignment. Adam was the first man to lead, to lead the human race. Eve was the first woman chosen and created by God to be Adam's helpmate. 
and to populate the human race. What can we learn from this First Lady Eve? Well, one thing is for sure, she evidently stayed by Adam's side until death, and he stayed by her side. And yes, I'm sure there had to be some really rough patches along the way. There may have been many times that Adam, after a long, hard day of tilling the ground, looked at her and, and may, may have said, so you had to go and eat of that apple, huh? And I'm sure that Eve would maintain on many occasions, maintain her patience. Now, ladies, come on, let's be real now. We have our moments. There may have been moments when Eve maintained her patience and not say anything, but stay or walk away silently, which is sometimes the best thing to do, okay, to avoid any further drama. And at times, her patients were in things she may have turned around and retaliated saying, well, you act as if you didn't take a bottle out of it, Mr. Perfect. So I'm sure they had their ups and downs like us women have, first ladies have. And, you know, there are times when, you know, we can look at our husbands and like, mm, just take that big hmm and then just turn away and like, honey, I don't do that anyway. <laughs> but keeping it real, keeping it real. I got to tell you, President Truman couldn't have said it better, better when he said, I hope someday someone will take the time to evaluate the true role of the wife of a president and to assess the many burdens she has to bear and the contributions that she makes. I say the same thing, replacing the word president with the word pastor. She is a hostess, a teammate, a champion, a policy advocate, a mom, a grandma, a counselor. So many hats she wears that she must have, you know, many women, especially in some of the Baptist churches, the hats are, you know, a common thing. But I'm sure in a spiritual sense, we could fill walls and walls of closets with all the different hats that first ladies wear, walls and walls of closet. Okay. It's a, it, as first ladies, it comes. This is a role that comes without a human written rule book. The only rule, rule book rule book that we have is the word of God. And thankfully, that should be enough. But sometimes you do need a shoulder to cry on. You need a friend to lean on. That, my ladies, is not easy to find. But you will. In due time, you will. I remember times as first lady when as my husband started pastoring. Things were rough sometimes, you know, I'm growing and I'm learning to ask for the things, Lord, give me patience. That's the worst thing that a first lady could ask for patience because you're just going to get slapped left and right, left and right. So you could create patience. But there were times when I would walk to church and I'm like, oh, goodness, I just don't I just don't feel like going today. I just don't want to see this one and I don't want to see that one. This is reality. This is the reality of us human beings. We cannot hide them. But as first ladies, we spend time encouraging other women in the church to take leading roles because we've been there and done that. And we know who they are. We know their, their gifts and we honor the God-given dreams that God has given them. See, as first ladies, we do what we're gifted to do, not just what we're expected to do. So remember that. You do what you've been gifted to do, not just what you've expected to do. You can write that down and put it on your wall on a post-it note. We are the Esthers of this millennium. We are here to utilize influence over the affairs of community. See, God didn't invite you or me into this role to just sit. He invited us to serve, to serve others, to serve humanity. Yes, you are married. But keep in mind that you got married to your, spouse, to, to your spouse to build a life, not to build a ministry. You are your husband's senior advisor, his confident, his most enduring friend. That is your greatest blessing. Your ministry, our ministry, is at many times one of quiet power. I like what Mother Moon wrote, magical powers, quiet powers. We are here to serve, not just to sit. You know, in Proverbs 31, 31, where it says, give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. So we give you the fruit of the hands. Proverbs 31, 25, it says, strength 
Strength and dignity are her clothing. And she laughs at the time to come. Sometimes it's not easy for first ladies to laugh. It um, Sometimes you have to just like grin and bear it. And like, okay, I understand that. You know, when you speak with your teeth closed and your mind is going, but you don't just don't want to say it out there. You're like, ah, oh, if I just get her in the right place. But anyway, that happens. But my favorite verse, and now you can make it yours, in your times of doubt, your times of anger, your times of jealousy. Yeah, that happens. Isaiah 62, 3. Love that verse. It says, you shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. So anytime you feel down or out, just remember that verse. And I said jealousy. Yes, at one time, I remember years ago, that I have one sister in the church that she went around saying that I was a jealous wife. Well, my first inkling in the, fe- in the flesh was to confront her, give her a piece of my mind, and in addition, I, I consider maybe a nice slap in the face, but that was just here. I, you know, I wouldn't do it in person, but come on, it was three of mine. We got to be real. I love keeping it real because it's like, it's like a support group. See, as first wives, first ladies and first wives, yes, we women need to have that support group. And it comes from us, that support group where they can yell and scream and say whatever they want. And we won't judge. We can judge their actions, but we will not condemn them. They need to let it out. They need to let it out. I took a class, a course with certification for a support group, which I was going to start until when the pandemic hit on for Alzheimer and dementia caregivers. And I was going to do the spouses, the wife or the husband. And one of the things they they taught us at the group was if the spouse comes in and sits in your group and says, today, I just hate my husband. I could just kill him. You can just look at her and say, yes, I understand that. I understand that. Because we have one lady in the group who said, came and she testified that one day she said her husband had dementia. And she said that she went to the house and we, she said, I cooked and we sat down and we had a beautiful dinner. I even lit some candles and it was great. And, and we laughed. It was like nothing ever happened. She said, and then I'm up and I'm washing the dishes in the kitchen and I'm really happy. And he comes into the kitchen and he looks at me and he says, so miss, when are you leaving? She said, I felt like killing him. And sometimes as first ladies of the church, we feel that too, but the other women in that place can feel that too. The only difference is that you're not going to tell the ladies in your church that you feel like killing your husband because you always want to keep him as senior pastor in that level. There are certain things that you have to keep to yourself. And that's why we have God to be able to go to him and cry to him and yell at him because prayer changes things, but it begins by changing me. It begins by changing you. You can't keep praying, Lord, change my husband, Lord, change me because in my change, things begin to happen and get better. I remember one time preaching in the church and I said, how can you ladies pray for God to change your husband when here you are in church on a Sunday morning and you're praising God and you're saying amen to the word and you're here singing hallelujah and all that. And then when you walk into your house, the first thing you walk in and your husband's there. So that's all you did all day, watch football. He's going to look at you and say, didn't you just come from church? So it's got to be you that initiates that start to a beautiful relationship. See, a church is, a church's first lady is commonly, yes, the senior pastor's wife. It's a position of authority, such as this requires the first lady to perform a host of duties. But Psalm 31, 15 says, our lives, we are, our lives are in God's hands. We are to depend on God for sustenance, protection, provision, and life. See, we depend on God for sustenance, protection, provision, and life. There were times as first lady, lady, me, prior to being elevated as a pastor, when I did find it hard to go to church, but I knew that my strength came deeply, deeply, and always from the Lord. See, God will always come to your rescue. I know, firsthand experience, he came to Mary, he came to Pastor Jane Wells' rescue, uh, Dr. Benson, he came to the rescue. You know, being left a widow is bad enough, 
but then being left a widow and to oversee a church, they went through the steps. They were there as first lady, then possibly a co-pastor or whatever. They had to go through all those steps to get to where God gave them this final divine assignment, divine assignment in their life. See, you will hit some hard bumps in the journey. You will sink down in the valley, but like a goat, like a goat with hinds feet, you will climb that mountain and you will slip a bit, but you keep climbing. The angels are there helping you. See, my husband always, but lately he's been teaching a lot and I've been keeping that in mind. The enemy, and I rebuke him in Jesus' name. He hates women. He's a user. He's an abuser. He's the one that makes you feel angry and confused. And I'm going to get a divorce because I can't take this. I hate the people in the church. These women, they're crazy. Yeah, I'm seeing, I'm looking at that woman. Ah, my husband. What? You bet. I'm looking at her, putting her eyes on my husband. No, you keep yourself steady because the one that's in control is God and the Holy Spirit through you. See, the Holy Spirit entunes and joins our spirit. And when the Holy Spirit joins your spirit, then it governs your soul because your soul is the one that wants to yell and cry out and all that. It governs your soul. And when that happens, then heavenly things and blessed things are expressed through your body. So you're no longer tensed. You're no longer walking in and putting your face because your Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has joined with your spirit, has governed your soul, and it reflects in the expressions of your body. So you walk with a high walk, but not a proud walk, a humble walk, but a high, nice walk. We are here. The one thing, the one thing, and I have, you know, you never too old to learn, ever, ever too old to learn. The one thing that will truly have, have, help you overcome is that you may want and desire many gifts. We do want them. As first ladies, I want, I pray for it. I want the gift of wisdom, the gift of knowledge, revelation, prophecy, healing. I used to ask for those too. But in the past few years, I have found that this, these gifts mean absolutely nothing if I don't have the greatest gift, the gift of love. First Corinthians tells you what love does not do. That must be your prayer daily. Lord, pour love into my heart. Change my heart from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh filled with love. Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. That love overcomes all things, all things. You have to love your church. You have to love the members of your church as much as you love your husband, as much as you love yourself, but as much as you love God. God can only pour that love into you. So first ladies today, let's take honor in our role. Let's take pride in what the assignment, the divine assignment that God has given us to do. We are a helpmate. We are there to help and help the young ladies in our church, help the older ladies, start a prayer group. There's many things that a first lady can do. You can just sit, but if you're going to sit and you feel that you don't have the overall to do all these great things by your husband, you can sit and pray. Prayer changes things. Prayer works. Since the pandemic, we have been running a prayer group every Thursday. And I have more people in that prayer group than I have when they came, when I invited them to come to church and pray because they're in the comfort of their home on a phone, not even on Zoom. We don't even look at them on that phone. And we have people calling from Albany, Massachusetts, everywhere because they're in need. And the greatest part is we've heard the testimonies, the beautiful testimony, prayer works. Start a prayer group. Don't worry about it. And you don't have to have a person that prays, you know, prayer or have a degree in praying orally let them pray their hearts i have one lady who prays very simple and her words are very very simple but the heart behind it is beautiful and that's what we have i'm going to end i found this poem and i kind of just want to share it and it's titled honoring our first ladies and it says you have stood faithfully along the side of the man of god with love support, encouragement, and faith. 
setting an example of true commitment to him and the work he has been called to do. The wife of a pastor is no ordinary role. It's not for the jealous nor timid soul. So I take this moment without further ado to say we celebrate you. Though demands are never ending and recognitions are few, your smiles are ever present, never stale, each new one. You're an example to the sister and encourager to the brother while obeying Christ's command that we serve one another. You're gloriously appreciated as an enhancer of life. You're not just a queen, you're a pastor's wife. God bless you, love you, and thank you so much.